Hello and welcome to the ABSA Business Day Supplier Development Dialogues. Great to be back with you again as we honour the companies that are going above and beyond in the way they make use of supply development to build successful, sustainable supply chains. I'm Joanne Joseph. Well, as you know, these awards were created to promote supply development and skills transfer throughout the sector, but they're also useful in drawing attention to the benefits of industry collaboration and they encourage high standards in benchmarking supplier development good practice. Join this growing network of companies and contribute to a sustainable economy through supplier development. Just go to www.sdawards.co.za. All right, so for the second time this week, actually, I'm facilitating a conversation about ethics. It's a reminder that these discussions are justifiably happening all around us. And today, we're talking more specifically about ethics in the supply chain. Polity's study, Corruption in Africa, Implications for Development, concedes that corruption is a global phenomenon. But it also reminds us that graft is more rampant and visible in many sub-Saharan African countries than on any other continent. Ethical business practice is everywhere one's responsibility because we're all affected by it and it extends to ensuring sustainability by caring for our people and planet while profiting from a business point of view. So if an ethical supply chain is now a requirement in the global economy, what does that mean for companies that don't adhere? And for those that want to, how do they work towards an ethical business value chain? That's the thrust of what we'll be putting to our panel today. If you have any questions for our panel members, remember you can post them live in the live chat. Just tell me who you'd like to answer your question. I'll do my best to integrate that into our discussion as we move along today. So let's meet the panel. Lola Adegagne leads the Business Integrity and Anti-Corruption Policy Reform Programs in Africa at the Center for International National Private Enterprise. Tiamo Makalwane is Head of Group Procurement Risk and Perfor Governance at ABSA Group. She's with me in studio this morning. Professor Dion Rousseau is CEO of the Ethics Institute. Lita Kuta is Director of Enterprise and Supplier Development at Tiger Brands. And Lisa Pierce is the Industrial Development Corporation's Manager for Environment, Health and Safety. Welcome to you all. Really lovely to have you with us today. All right, so Dion, I'm going to ask you to start by sketching this picture for us. And, and what I'm asking you is probably a little tricky because I'm not sure we, we have a terribly tangible measure of this. But can you give us a sense of what the state of ethics more generally in our country is at the moment? Um, morning, Joe. And, and, and yes, um, if we started at that question, I, I think we should admit by saying that it's quite fragile. It was quite a shock, uh, I think, to the system, um, if we see what happened over the last years with state capture. And of course, it was not only a uh, public service department, it was state-owned entities and a lot of private sector companies who was also involved uh, in that whole uh, exercise in corruption that we've seen uh, laid out here in South Africa. So, so if we talk about this, the state of ethics, we can say uh, on the one side, it is fragile, but I think it also opened up the possibility for, for all organizations, public and private sector, to say, well, now we understand how important ethics is. And I've never before in my entire career seen so many conversations about the need for ethical leadership and the need to restore trust in our organizations. So I think with the bad, there's also a more positive side in the sense that there's a very strong commitment coming out from uh, the public sector, from state-owned entities, from the private sector, to restore trust. And we know that you can only restore trust in organizations um, if you are ethical, if you are competent, and if you are open. There was actually a recent survey done on trust um, globally. Quite a, a number of countries uh, participated in the Edelman Trust Barometer. And it, it showed that especially trust in, in, in our government is at an all-time low. But in that same study, they also said, but what is needed to restore trust? And the two things that came out tops was competence and ethics. And then they also asked some of the multinationals who participated in that. So what would you say is the element that contributes most to people trusting you? And they said it's about ethics. About 76% of our trust capital depends on whether we act in an ethical way and whether we are seen as a responsible member of society. 
So, so Joanna, I think uh, on the one hand, yes, it is fragile, but on the other hand, I think I can see a very clear commitment to turn this around and to restore trust by being competent, but also by being ethical. I, I think that's hugely encouraging uh, coming out of the period which we have. Tiamo, are you sensing the same thing in business? Do you get a sense that, that businesses are taking ethics more seriously than before? I couldn't agree with you more there, Joanne, in terms of the businesses. Like, for instance, if I look at uh, APSA as a whole, yesterday we actually launched and celebrated our ethics day where we were looking at standardizing, making sure that we have the ethics standards that will mean the barometer which will give us the sense of how should we be dealing with ethics throughout the country. Trust is a big issue. And if trust is a big issue, it's like in a marriage situation mm -hmm. where you enter into a relationship, especially in, 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 as a young person, to sustain that kind of a relationship, what do you need? You need trust. And therefore, in applying your DNA of the ethical behavior, your actions speaks for the behavior. And therefore, I agree that uh, uh, ethics are very, very important in our world. And especially that business is in taking business. them more seriously. Okay, that's Especially that's in business, mm -hmm. because it, in the way our code of ethics within the AFSA environment, in actual fact, it, not only does it set the standards, but it gives us that element of uh, uh, being authentic about ourselves, being the leaders, taking action for corruption. We can sit and do nothing, or we can actually act. Mm. And the choice is ours. Mm. If we act against bad behavior, then we are on our way to do something much better. All right. Well, well that, that certainly is a, a step in the right direction. I mean, uh, of course, Lola, we, we've emerged from this really dark period in our democracy where we've been grappling with these issues, a serious lack of, of ethical behavior across sectors. G give me a sense of, of this because it's not just business. It's got to be government. It's got to be civil society as well, taking each of the, uh, t these sectors into account, taking the, this, this discussion on ethics and, and the commitment to this behavior, ethical behavior, seriously. Are you feeling that movement switch? sweeping our society across sectors? Now, I'm optimistic and cautiously optimistic. Um, I, you know, I'll just caveat with that. And, and that's a really good question, Joanne. I, I think so. So just as Dion said, you know, and, you know, Shyama mentioned, we are seeing more of a focus on ethics as everyone's responsibility. Um, a few years ago, it was really just the government's, you know, responsibility. Uh, businesses will think, well, there's very little we can do about corruption. It's, it's the public sector. Uh, that's, that's where all the corruption is. Um, civil society organizations did their best, you know, and they're still working really hard. And, and um, in more recent times, we're now seeing the private sector stepping up and saying, hey, we need to self-regulate. We need to do more. But what is even more um, exciting for me in Africa is the fact that, you know, for many years, the private sector had stepped up. Uh, but we haven't really paid attention to the small and growing businesses or what some call the MSMEs, right? The micro, small, and mid-sized enterprises. They make 750, about 750 million um, MSMEs across Africa. You're talking about 90% of MSMEs uh, uh, make up the, the business community. But for a long time, when we talk about ethics and integrity, we're really looking at the large companies and they just make, a tiny, make up a tiny percent of the business community. Now, in the last... Um, let's say three to five years, it's exciting to see that, you know, from a lot of the work the Center for International Private Enterprise has done, um, from what we're doing with the Aspen Network for Development Entrepreneurs, we're reaching more small and mid-sized enterprises and saying, hey, we can actually change things around here. You know, we can actually make an effort to push back on, on corruption. Now, we don't do this alone. You know, we need the government to work with us and we have a lot of success stories in, collect, in terms of collective action, you know, in terms of business integrity and compliance capacity for the MSMEs in a way that, you know, in a way that's contextualized, you know, in a way that makes sense for a small business. You know, it's not expensive, it's affordable. 
it, it's applicable to a small business. And so I'm very optimistic that we're seeing change come into the African continent because the MSMEs are a majority uh, block in the private sector. And if they join forces with the multinationals, um, with the government, with CSOs, that they're, that's great. There are great prospects right there. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next five years to see how things, you know, how things turn around. That's why I'm optimistic, but I'm cautious. I want to make sure that we stay focused. Um, we all have that responsibility to make sure we stay focused in empowering MSMEs to join this effort. And, and, and I think what you're saying is absolutely right there, um, that, that we, uh, Lola, we're, we're not simply going to, to get this done overnight. This has got to be a rethinking of the mindset of a culture that's actually been entrenched in, in the country. And uh, Tiamo, you want, you want, do you want to comment on that? Because I hear you, I hear you responding to that. And, and what I've noticed in the country in the last few years, that, that after there was this sort of shift in leadership where corruption became the order of the day, that all of us somehow became contaminated by the idea that it was acceptable and some of us actually acted on that idea. Exactly. You see, we create norms to ourselves when <clears throat> we act, whether good or bad, or whether we have certain behaviors that are uh, not, uh, in, in, not in line mm. with what is expected of the moral society. So if you breed a bad culture, you will breed the results of a bad culture. But then if you do good deeds, you're destined for good fortune. So I agree that the culture that we've been living in is that one of do nothing, look at it, it's corruption. However, if you look at it going forward, it's like, it's time to change. Mm -hmm. And if that time to change is now, let's all, everyone, participate in the change. Yeah. Lisa, I want to ask you, what is considered best ethics practice in the country and on the continent right now? Good morning, Joanne, and good morning to everybody listening. I think at IDC, we definitely take the view that when we look at the rest of Africa, we, we, we use the, the legal framework that exists in the different African countries as the first port of call when we look at compliance around, and, and I'm specifically now referring to ESG aspects, environmental and social aspects in the transactions that we deal with. And we take a view that when the, the national legislation in the country doesn't adequately provide for something, um, as the, and then two examples perhaps um, on waste disposal, hazardous waste disposal is, is one that we often see. And another example might be uh, dislocation or relocation of people and communities when, when um, new develops are, are taking place. So when we see that the, the national legal framework doesn't adequately cover these issues, then we will look towards uh, international guidance from the treaties um, and frameworks that exist internationally, especially where South Africa is a party. So we would look at those first. Um, and, and we would provide guidance on what would be uh, an acceptable level of performance, for instance, from our investee clients when we look into to the rest of Africa. Uh, Lisa, Lola may, uh, made an interesting point about SMA, MMEs and said we're not focusing enough on them. Um, clearly, they, they need to meet compliance standards for supply chain purposes and so forth. Uh, and, and you want to bring them in line. You want to know that from the very word go, from the time they enter the supply chain, they understand their ethical responsibilities. How do we get them into that, that sort of thinking? Thank you. Well, first, the, the issue of supply development is a social and economic justice matter because it's about integrating black suppliers into procurement where previously they were not actually um, you know, uh, accommodated. Therefore, issues of ethics and morality um, becomes an issue because you, you, you become obliged as a company to say, if I'm doing supply development and transformation, I'm already putting my high moral ground to say I am going to be part of dealing with the ills of the past. So the issues that uh, SMEs get uh, when they come into um, uh, the, the space of uh, supply development, one of the first problems that you find is that they don't know the processes that corporates are actually adopting because there's secrecy and issues of secrecy also talks to issues of ethics because it means some people know about the opportunities and some people do not know about the opportunities. And there are instances where there's a deli it's, it's deliberate 
for, for making people know or not to know. And secondly, there are issues, again, that talks to um, uh, policies, uh, because when you look at companies, they need to put the, the right policies in place to drive the right behavior. For example, you need an ethical sourcing policy that actually starts to regulate issues of governance, human rights, you know, sustainability, and even procurement. So for, for, for smaller SMEs, you need to be able to start putting in programs to make sure that you open up opportunities. They are aware of them, and also they get supported to actually contest these opportunities because some of them who are lucky enough to know have no idea how to put together a compelling business case to be considered favorable. So you need to be able to do that. Secondly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the people that works in supply chain because most of these individuals come from different backgrounds with different moral standards. Therefore, the value system of the organization needs to be very clear in terms of saying, if we adopt transformation, therefore our staff who are uh, entrusted to drive transformation have to adopt and embrace those policies. Because if you don't do that, then you're gonna have an issue of SMEs coming for business and not being given an opportunity because it's either the buyer is not interested, they, some of them might be anti-transformation, some of them lack trust in black suppliers, right? Um, and some for right reason and some for not, you know, for, for no apparent reason other than what they hear outside of the organization. So issues of making sure you work with the the employees becomes critical. On the SME side, we need to be able to develop them to be ready for these opportunities, make them understand how they navigate the corporate you know, uh, processes because most of them get lost into that. Whereas you see some you know, um, SMEs that are transformed, they get helped into the system. So it talks to issues of how one is helped to the black supplier besides the same support not being provided to a black supplier. So SMMEs really need to be helped because it's a huge system when you talk about supply chains. But once you provide the necessary help, the guidance, and make sure you've got people in the system that actually is keen to support them, but at the same time, you've got a strategy in this organization that makes sure that there's an oversight to make sure that the people inside supplier supply chain teams are actually doing the right thing. Because if you don't manage that, then you're going to have very many SMMEs that are coming in but the system is spitting them out purely because they haven't been trained and capacitated well enough to not only get into the system, but also to stay in it. And also you just have to make sure you've got people that will give them enough opportunities and chances so that they can be able to grow and understand they will have challenges, but they will overcome the challenges the more you give them an opportunity. Again, the issue around whether they've got the patience to do that can also talk to issues of ethics where one is given an opportunity and one is not. Right. You know, that, that talks to, as well, the kind of legislation and the regulatory environment that exists in order to, to ensure that everyone is compliant. Dion, let me bring you back in here. Our audience is already asking some really important questions. Uh, here's a question I'm going to ask you, and this is from uh, Brandon uh, Dion. Is there any legislation that governs and enforces certain ethical standards? I'm quite sure that there, there is generally in the country, that kind of national legislation. But but uh, let's talk as well about business in this country and, and whether in your experience, uh, on, on an internal level, the legislation or reg regulatory environment exists for ethical standards to be maintained. Dion? Yeah, and, and there are indeed uh, quite a number of, of, of legal standards, but also a whole lot of best practice, uh, practice standards that we can look at. If we start with, with the public sector, of course, there's something like uh, the public service regulations, which um, prescribes what public service departments need to do uh, when it comes to ethics, that they need to appoint people uh, who actively manage ethics in, in the public service. There should be ethics committees and, and the like. But also if we move on to, to um, the, the private sector, if we look at our Companies Act here in South Africa, at least, we have something called the Social and Ethics Committee. And if you go to the regulations there, there are clear indications of certain ethical obligations that companies have towards the societies in which they operate, towards the economy, towards uh, the environment, and also towards people inside and outside of the organization. And, and this is a prescribed mandate, and these things need to be monitored, and if there is non-compliance, it needs to be reported. But I think, um, Joanne, very importantly, if we start looking at best practice in corporate governance, and we take uh, King 4 uh, as, as one of the leading standards in the world, 
you would see that the, the first three principles out of a total of 16 deals with ethics. Because there's a clear understanding that if you want to run a well-governed organization, it must stand on an ethical basis. But in, in the very first principle of, of King 4, it also uh, alerts us to the fact that we should not only look at the law. In fact, it calls on people, on leaders in organizations to act ethically beyond mere legal compliance. Because very often we can do wrong things by hiding behind the law. And therefore, ethics always put up a higher standard. And, and ultimately, it's not laws and regulations that will ensure that we have ethical organizations. The only thing that will ensure that we have ethical organizations is if we build strong ethical cultures, which means it becomes a habit to do the right thing, even when nobody is watching. It is simply part of our identity, part of our DNA, to do things in an ethical manner and not to, to wait till the law catches us out, because the law always comes too late and there's always too few eyes to see, too few hands to catch. And that is why that uh, locus of control should not be external and rely on legislation and regulation, but it should be inside organizations. You, you make an excellent point, you know, do the right thing when no one is watching. That ties into our next question from Kathy Baxter. And I want to put this one to you, Lola, because Kathy says, if everyone claims they're ethical, because who would say the opposite, how do we get people to be more ethical in business? And it seems like a very simplistic question, doesn't it? But, I mean, we've had companies go out into the public domain, uh, you know, talk about or pay lip service to, to anti-corruption. And then a few months later, out comes the a breaking story about a, a dodgy contract that, uh, that has, been, uh, has been in place for a number of years. Lola? That's, uh, that's an interesting question, Joanne. And, and um, I, I would say this, Dion started to, you know, talk about this uh, from the context of, you know, legislature, legislation and, and um, law enforcement versus um, self-regulation and incentives. And so let's break it down to the analogy of sticks and carrots, right? The carrot and the stick. So we think about legislation and law enforcement as the stick, um, but frankly, you will never have enough resources in any law enforcement agency, even in developed countries, to sufficiently investigate and, and put bad guys in, in jail, right? Or to make sure um, you know, that companies are doing the right thing. And so you want to think about you know, the carrots. And I want to add a third um, thing to this, which is the bad carrot. You want to think about first the good carrot. How do you incentivize good behavior? Because here's the thing, many businesses and business owners want to do things right. They actually want to be ethical. A lot of times businesses are coerced into doing, um, into doing the wrong things. I'll tell you, because there's, there's lots of surveys out there and you might know of a business survey um, that demonstrates it's been done in at least five different, um, five different continents um, and, and within different setups in business communities in, the, in, the, in, in school environments. And you actually find that at least somewhere in the region of 10 to 30% of people would never compromise their ethics, regardless of the situation. And you find an equal amount, 10 to 30% would always be willing to compromise regardless of the, of the, of the, of the uh, situation. But those in the middle, so you're talking about 70% of people, if the, the situation is right, they will compromise. What is the right situation for a business or anyone to compromise their, 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 their um, standards, their moral ethics, their commitment to integrity? It's when the, there's systemic corruption, when there are inefficiencies in the government, uh, in the public regulation systems. If I, as a small business, need to renew my license and I have to travel to uh, from, you know, Abia State or Kano State in Nigeria all the way to um, Lagos, or I have to travel, you know, in Ethiopia from one of the regions to Addis Ababa, and I have to spend five days. I may not have relatives there. I'm paying for a hotel. You know, if businesses have to rationalize what it costs them to do business with integrity versus what it costs them to pay a small bribe and have a friend fix the problem for them, fixing quotes right? It's easy for them to want to compromise. And that's where this comes in. 
many businesses want to do things right, but if the systems aren't working for them, or if, um, if the systems involving other companies, civil society and the government enables and encourages corrupt activity, then they're unfortunately going to fall for that. And that's why it's important for the mindset to change. Businesses need to know not everybody is doing this. There is a way out. There is a different way of doing things. And then organizational culture needs to change. Once mindset changes for business owners to know there is an alternative and I just need to find that alternative to compromising. And then they need to change the org culture. If, they, if business owners who are ethical don't set ethical organizational cultures in the organizations, employees would set it for them. And just as Lita was saying, employees come from different backgrounds. They might come with unethical backgrounds. And if, if the head of the business doesn't set an ethical culture in the business organization, it would be taken over by the employees. And finally, collective action. Once a business has changed the leader's mindset, changed its org culture, it then needs to remember it can't do this alone because this is a systemic problem. Join a group. And, and this is part of why Sipe set up the um, Ethics First initiative, which I'm happy to talk more about. Um, Joanne, I, I hope that answers the question. I'm excited to talk more about uh, Ethics First and some of the ideas that we're pushing forward to help businesses really find their footing in being able to push back and say no to corruption. I, I, I love the ideas that you've raised there. There are just so many, so many aspects to them, so much to extrapolate from what you just said. So I'm going to take it step by step and I will come back to that point on, on best practice and, and, uh, and, and exactly what is being innovated in regard to that. Uh, Donovan Stevens, one of our viewers, is, has some kind of telepathy with me this morning because we were thinking of ex exactly the same thing at the same time, Donovan. He says, as a business advisor, I believe that sustainability, ethics, ethical leadership are the main problems for a successful supply chain management system of which I have first-hand experience. He says uh, ethics is important for the business in four aspects, customers, suppliers, competitors, and employees. However, how do subordinates ensure ethical behavior from management, especially if those subordinates are regarded as a threat or whistleblowers? And Siamo, this is a huge thing for me, whistleblowers and the reality of, of the entire destruction of their, their lives that they have experienced. People like Athol Williams, Correct. who've spoken about countries like Bain, and have, have nothing, have almost lost everything as a result of what they have put out into the public domain. Interesting you should say that. You know, we put standards, we put laws, and the action that comes out is business is, seems to be corrupt. Whistleblowing, on the other hand, is something, it's, it's the, 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 the people who are whistleblowers, like your authors, they actually go through a change within themselves to say, you know what, I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to leave it and do no harm, but I'd rather take an action. Mm -hmm. And it's at that risk of being victimized all the time. It's at the risk of losing everything. So how many of the community are in that middle of taking action? Not so many. And then you want to do the right thing. If society at large are ethical from home to work and authentic about themselves, then they'll be able to carry themselves in their ethical way regardless, and therefore doing the right thing beyond compliance. And that is the expertise that we are dying for, that business must invest in because it's scalable in nature that if everyone participate in that realm, then they are able to deliver on the ethical things. So coming back to the point of whistleblowing, mm -hmm. if you're doing the right thing, it shouldn't scare you to do to be a whistleblower because you are doing the right thing. You know, I, I agree with you in theory, Tiamo, but but Lisa, my problem is that in, in practice, it often doesn't work that way. I mean, when we look at the number, I've, I just gave one example in Athol Williams, but there are so many examples of people who've lost everything, their livelihood, uh, their, their mental health, they've jeopardized relationships, they've lost uh, their assets. Uh, there's so much to lose uh, because business doesn't seemingly seem to be supporting that that important action and that important role that a whistleblower plays in, in flagging dishonesty or corruption, perhaps in the supply chain. 
Lisa? Have we lost Lisa? I think we might have Hi. lost our... Hi, no, Joanne. No, you're still with us. Okay, great. Go ahead, Lisa. No, absolutely. I think for the whistleblower, there is always a personal risk um, of loss and of being exposed. But I, I agree completely with Shiamu that if you're doing the right thing, then the systems that are in place to support the whistleblower should come into play and support that person. Um, it should not be that the whistleblower becomes a victim of the process. And as you know, as what we expect of our own society is that it, it, there shouldn't be such a need for whistleblowers to be putting themselves personally at risk to such an extent. If our culture, uh, if our business cultures are ethical as a foundation, then that personal risk would certainly be lessened. So, so let me ask you this, Lita, because of, of course you, you're the uh, the uh, ESD director for Tiger Brands. You've got an enormous organisation. Your supply chain, the scale of it, must be fairly massive. W what's been built into that system to prevent the kind of bureaucracy that Lola has spoken about, which often results in dishonesty when people can't meet the exacting standards of what's required, or they simply don't know how to adhere to the company's compliance regulations. Right, yeah, the, the first thing that one has to do firstly is to actually lift the veil just to be aware of opportunities. It always starts there. Because once you start to do that, then possibilities for entrepreneurs becomes endless. And, and part of that, we've, we've launched a market access program so that entrepreneurs can register and when opportunities arise, we're able to actually make them aware of that. But we also know that it doesn't end. You also have to help them to pick put very strong uh, you know, proposals because uh, many of them who get away with these opportunities falter when, filter when, when it comes to having quality proposals. And then part of it, which is very critical, is then you support them to go and pitch for opportunities. And most importantly, when they don't get these opportunities, because some of them will win, some won't, is to be able to provide the feedback so that they are able to learn to say, look, these are the areas of weakness that you had. But over and above that, you also need other policies to support that process. We need to have a very strong, as I said, ethical policy. For example, from Tiger, we've got an ethical policy that manages and regulates fronting. Last year, we were the, the big commissioner gave us an award for reporting fronting of companies that were, were white owned and they were actually masking as if they were black owned. And when we pick them up, because that club, that actually now is a misrepresentation, it's a fraud basically, and it's 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 it's, it's uh, closing opportunities for black entrepreneurs who are deserving of those opportunities. So not only do you just want to make sure that you support the entrepreneurs, but you also have to be very vigilant because not everything that comes through the door that says they are black-owned business, they are actually black-owned business. You know, so you have to also make sure that you've got staff within the system that not only are bold when they pick up these things, but when it's time to go and report it to authorities, we're able to do that in the company. You know, because I know some of my colleagues will say that we pick up these things, but the system just shuts it down. They don't want us to report it, right? So it gets perpetuated all the time. And sometimes I think one of the comments is, um, I think Lola said, you just don't have enough eyes and ears to pick up everything that walks into the door. So, so absolutely, I mean, we, we, we've got the last 10 minutes and I want us to focus on the positive strategies that are in place to solve the ethical dilemmas that we face in our society right now. And Dion, can you give me a sense of, of what we need to put in place right now to ensure that uh, the supply chain and more generally society subscribes to the ethical standards we should be aspiring to? No, uh, jo Joanna, I think the very first thing that we need to do is to connect um, ethics with the purpose, the success, and the sustainability of our organization. If ethics is, is somebody's hobby, um, something on the side, it will never become uh, deeply ingrained in the culture of our organizations. So it is so important for organizations to understand that unless they are ethical, they will never attain the purpose for which they was created. Um, they will never be sustainably successful. And if you make that connection between ethics and your own purpose, success, and sustainability, I think the, the war is, is, is almost won. But then there are a number of practical things that need to be done. 
And the first thing is to be very clear, very articulate about your ethical standards, about the things that you won't tolerate in your organizations, but more importantly, the things that you want people to do. You know, Joanne, so often we, we think that we can get what we want by focusing on what we don't want. And, and that's a myth. You don't become an ethical organization by rooting out unethical practices. Of course, you need to do that, but you need to do more than that. You need to focus on what you want. And once you have clarity about the ethical standards that are part of our DNA, then of course, it's about um, showing that you are serious about this. And this is where leadership example becomes so important. And where your CEO is not only your chief executive officer, but also your chief ethics officer to set the tone for the entire company. And once you, you have the combination of clarity of standards, clear leadership commitment to that, then it's a matter of motivating people to also follow the, those standards. And I think this is where I often see things going wrong, because very often companies try to intimidate the employees into being ethical. We hear so much about zero tolerance, one strike and you're out. That is probably the worst way to get people to be ethical. You want them to understand why ethics is absolutely key to our success and our sustainability and to embrace ethics so that they internalize it. Because ultimately, if you always have to watch people, they will only do the right thing as long as somebody is watching. And to get that deep transformation, you really need to motivate people, uh, persuade them over time to see this makes sense. If we want to be successful and sustainable, we need to do our business in an ethical manner. Yeah. So, Joanne, I, I would say those are a number of pointers in terms of, of what we need yeah. to do. Makes a lot of sense. You've just been through that process, Tiamo. Do you agree with, with what Dion says? I couldn't agree fully mm -hmm. because, I mean, what he what resonates with me in that regard is about doing the right thing mm. in with the aim to help others who can't so that we can have an ethical society and the tone at the top is the right place to start time of talking and planning it's over it's time to act yeah, I think that's a great uh, final message from you, Tiamo. Thank you for that. Lisa, what, what is it you want to leave our audience with in terms of, of uh, establishing ethical standards and adhering to those? Thanks, Joan. I think from an ESG perspective, I'd really want to see organizations starting to focus on enhancing their transparency. Transparency in reporting, um, which underpins license to operate for corporations and their reputation and to really start emphasizing the, the link that exists between being seen and perceived to being acting in, in an ethical manner and how that impacts on brand reputation and on corporate license to operate within their operating environment. And I think that transparency is greatly enhanced by using um, good frameworks that help us to understand the materiality of different aspects in our business. And frameworks like the GRI and the CDP, for instance, come to mind. But those established frameworks help us to frame the material issues. It helps us to really dissect the ethical issues that exist in different areas in our businesses and in our, our companies and the different sectors in which they operate. And to be able to share that information publicly. And then coupled to that, I think that to really embed an ethical culture, organizations should have the courage to admit when things did not go exactly as planned. Mm -hmm. So that transparency, that en enhanced accountability also comes when you are not just writing a good report um, your integrated report is great and looks wonderful. But also when you own up to you, perhaps you have not quite achieved the goal that you've set out for yourself. And be that in a social space, in a development space, or from an environmental perspective. But then also to say, listen, we own it. And this is what we're going to do to improve our business going forward. And that speaks to what our and other panelists have also been talking about trust. I think that that goes hand in hand. So for me, that would be the key thing to, to enhance ethics and trust and the way that we do business 
in, okay. in Africa and in South Africa as well. Lisa, thank you so much for that. It really makes a lot of sense. Lita, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, um, it, it, it all starts uh, from an enterprise and supply development with having a very clear, very succinct uh, transformation strategy, which you know, people when I look at it, they, they don't second guess. But just having it there is not enough. You've got to make sure that, I think as Dion said, embed it with your value system, because that takes the performance and the behavior that people need to drive. And as, as I said, supply development is a social and economic justice. Therefore, it's a moral and ethical issue of the country, most especially if you look at our history. And then you have to have a good change management program. Because understanding that people come from different backgrounds, if you want to take them along to, um, to embrace your values and strategy, you got to build them up and make sure there's a buy-in. And also, on top of that, they have a, a, a recognition for those that who have been yes that you see that they are actually developing black suppliers, they're giving them opportunities, recognize them, because that actually becomes an instrument for them to do more. And, and, and the last two points is make sure, I think, um, this talk about transparency, because unfortunately, gov um, if you look at government, they use an open tender system, so people know opportunities, and they can contact in private sector, no one knows anything, you know, the closed loop. So you gotta be able to provide a channel for transparency so that people are aware of these opportunities. And the last part, we need to be patient because we are taking SMEs who previously didn't get these opportunities and to develop them into strong suppliers, it takes time. So patience becomes very critical. And most companies today were given opportunities some point in the past and someone was patient. Thank you very much for that, uh, Lita. I'm going to put the last question to you, Lola, and ask you to wrap it up for us. It's a question from Khosana Ya Africa, which is a really good one. I know this is something you wanted to talk about. It says, seeing that COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of technology in all aspects of business, I would love to know, are there any key technological developments in varying sectors that have been adopted to enforce ethical supply chain? Any case study reference quoted, Lola? Thank you, Joanne. That's an excellent question. And yes, there is one um, that I can talk extensively about. Uh, but before I get there, I'll just back up a little bit to really start off with saying businesses must take responsibility for the situation or you know the political and economic situation in Africa. Uh, what do I mean? Post COVID-19, um, there are you know, uh, projections that Africa will lose 20 to 30% of its fiscal revenue. We already had problems with generating revenue in Africa, which is the reason why we can't fund a lot of our public projects or even put more resources behind um, investigating and prosecuting corruption. And here we are in this catastrophic, catastrophic situation, right? Um, Africa would also experience, you know, an increase in its debt to GDP ratio, 60 to 70 percent. And this would really be going to shore up uh, public budgets which is just the basics of what, um, you know, what governments need to be able to do for communities. And finally, the projection that about 150 million people would be pushed into poverty, half of that again would be on the continent. So businesses need to, like Dion said, not just take ethics as uh, a side thing, they need to put ethics first in their operations because that's really the key to sustainability and scalability for African businesses. And I intended to use a pun there because the innovative idea, the technological idea that um, you asked me about, Joanne, is actually called Ethics First. It's an initiative that, you know, Cype and a lot of partners across the continent in South Africa, it's collective value creations. In Nigeria, it's the Institute of Directors and the Nigerian Stock Exchange. In Kenya, it's, it's a, you know, a host of partners across the continent who have come together to say, you know what? let's go to the weakest link in the private sector and enable them join us in this effort to increase ethics and integrity. And the weakest link really are the ones Dita and all of us have been talking about, the small and mid-sized enterprises. They are the ones who think that combating corruption um, is expensive and it's not a priority. Making money is the priority, right? Um, so we need to go to them and let them see and understand that corruption is actually a business risk. It's a sustainability risk, right? And there are ways um, to make sure that they can protect their businesses from corrupt activity. And we have to be realistic. Small and mid-sized businesses have to spend more time trying to figure out how to avoid corruption. And so with Ethics First, we're able to bring the resources to them for free. Um, small and mid-sized enterprises are able to improve their business integrity systems 
without having to pay anything to join this platform. But what is more is that this platform connects them with business opportunities. As Lisa has been saying, when a few businesses know about opportunities and others don't know, it creates a disadvantage. And at the same time, it creates a risk for corruption. And so the more businesses can demonstrate that they put ethics first in their operations, the more access they have to business opportunities and growth opportunities across the continent. And so I, I really invite everyone to check out, you know, Ethics First. It's a, you know, it's an application available to small and growing businesses everywhere in Africa. And we hope that this will really drive change for MSMEs, but also um, for the supply chain um, development, you know, community across, uh, across the continent. And so it does two things. It increases and improves transparency but it also helps digitalization for small businesses across the continent. Uh, across the continent, and so we're very optimistic about the change that will come um, through through Ethics First, and 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 how much it would help us make a dent in this effort to push back uh, corruption on the continent. I think that that really leaves us so with uh, such an an optimistic feeling as we wrap up this discussion today. We know that corruption has cost our country and continent so much over the years. We need to find the will to build honest and ethical conduct in the current generation of leaders and those to come. And we need to start that intervention immediately. I'm hoping you're going to be able to tap into some of the ideas our panelists have shared with you today to do exactly that. And that is where I will leave you as we wrap it up for today. If you need to refer back to any of the information we've covered. You can watch a recording of our discussion on YouTube and Business Day TV. Please note that the entries for 2021 have closed. But thank you to our panel members for their important insights and thank you to you for watching today. Many thanks to ABSA for partnering with Business Day Supplier Development Awards to highlight this crucial issue. From me, Joanne Joseph, take care. Bye-bye.